Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be updating you on my May and June reads for the Rereadathon 2019. So this is hosted by Alex Black and possibly some other people. I will link below to Alex's announcement video with all the challenges and all that stuff. I'll also link to my TBR as well. And uh, this builds on Catalyst Reads Rereadathon from uh, 2018, who uh, a former community member. I think he still watches sometimes. So hi, Michael, if you're watching. Hope you're well. And uh, yeah, so I have read two books that I want to update you on. I also took notes. Uh, another thing to mention as well is that for rereads, I only ever listen to audiobooks. So for the first read, I only ever read physical books. And then for rereads, I only ever do audiobooks. I actually did uh, 1.75 times speed as well, because why not? So we're going to start with my reread for May, which was Men at Arms by Terry Pratchett. This is, I believe, uh, like the eighth. Discworld novel, something like that, and uh, it's the second City Watch Discworld novel. And uh, I'll read you the blurb. Be a man in the City Watch. The City Watch needs men. But what it's got includes Corporal Carrot, technically a dwarf, Lance Constable Cuddy, really a dwarf, Lance Constable Detritus, a troll, Lance Constable Angua, a woman most of the time, and Corporal Nobs, disqualified from the human race for shoving. And they need all the help they can get because they've only got 24 hours to clean up the town, and this is Ankh Morpork we're talking about. So, straight away going into this, we're sort of straight back into a story about Carrot being the true king of Ankh Morpork. So basically, Ankh Morpork is one of the biggest cities in Terry Pratchett's Discworld. Uh, this is the, like, obviously the city watch to protect it. And they used to have a king, and then basically uh, Captain Vimes, who is the commander of the Ankh Morpork city watch, his ancestor, Old Stoneface Vimes, killed the last king, and ever since then they've had patricians. And, uh, you know, they're currently being ruled by a patrician. But especially in these early City Watch books, I think possibly only in these two, we get a little bit of kind of Carrot's backstory. And basically, he's the true king. And in this story and in the last one I read, which was Guards, Guards, which I'll link to my review of that below. Um, in both of those stories, we have this thread of Carrot being the true king. And then kind of at the end of this one, he basically just says he doesn't want it. You know, he's quite happy being a watchman, which is quite funny because the Ankh Morpork City Watch don't have a great reputation nobody really wants to be a watchman um it's a bit like you know being sent to the wall in game of thrones i guess people end up in the watch because they've got nowhere else to go we also have in this uh, gaspo the wonder dog who is a very underrated character he's basically a talking dog and he befriends sergeant angua who is the one who on the back it says a woman most of the time so she's a werewolf and we actually have this scene where because we kind of tease throughout of a romance between her and carrot and Basically, they have this scene where it looks like they're almost going to have sex, and then they can't because, oh, I'm running out of space. Jesus, all right, I have emptied my camera of footage, and we'll get back to where, where we were. So, I think I was talking about uh, Constable Carrot and Anger, and they have this kind of relationship, or it's sort of teased that they might have a relationship. And just as they're about to get it on, the uh, it's full moon, and she turns into a werewolf. And then Carrot's, like, terrified, because he's like... Where did this wolf come from and what did it do to Sergeant Angua? Or actually, I think she's just Constable Angua. Lance Constable. Yeah. There's also a great quote that Pratchett once said where uh, he was asked about sex in the Discworld books. And he says that there is sex in the Discworld books. It just happens a few pages after the end. And I think that's a really, like, a good way of looking at it. All right, what else? We got? Okay, speaking of sex, we have uh, Sam Vimes and Sybil Rankin. They're uh, getting married in this one. So they met in the previous book. And uh, their relationship's an interesting one. It kind of continues to develop throughout the books. And Rankin's just this... You know, you have this, like, thing of strong female characters. That's what she is, I think. But, like, not in a cliche way. So, for example, until she met Vime, she'd been a, pretty much like a spinster. She was dedicating most of her time to her sanctuary for sick dragons. And she obviously really cares about these dragons. And it's kind of made it her life's purpose to, to care for them, which I think is cool. I like there was a bit in here a reference to Vimes being able to tell wherever he is in the city because the soles in his cheap boots are so thin and he has like this theory on mathematics so rich men they buy one pair of boots for a hundred dollars and it lasts them for a lifetime whereas Vimes buys a new pair of boots every six months for ten dollars and so overall it costs him more but because he's not rich he can't afford to buy the expensive boots. I think he called it like the boots theory of trickle down economics or something. There was a great quote as well about the Rankins, uh, Sybil's family. So it said, uh, the Rankins were more highly bred than a hilltop bakery. 
which took me a second to get there, especially because I was listening on the audio book. So, you know, I wasn't reading it, I suppose, which I think would have probably got, got the double meaning over quicker. But yeah, that was cool. Uh, we obviously have, as you heard from the uh, from the RID, uh, Detritus joins the force. So he's actually been a character in it before, just as pretty much a general uh, a general troll. Although for some reason on the, on the audiobook he had a Scottish accent, and I, I don't understand why. I mean, a, a troll Scottish, is that a thing? Yeah, it's very strange. Uh, there was also a bit about uh, a bit some of the land near the Unreal University, which is where the wizards study, and uh, it's called Unreal Estate as opposed to Real Estate, which I liked. Uh, we have a mention here that I didn't pick up on before as well, but basically Vimes points out the old post office and he kind of talks about it being a failure. But that actually later gets, uh, there's a whole novel dedicated to it called Going Postal with uh, Moist von Lipwig and he kind of renovates the postal service. But then also, I mean, later on in the series we get the clacks, which are like semaphore towers that can be used to send messages. Um, they've not been invented by this point. And I just think it's really fascinating how you see the technology in this world develop as the years go on. Uh, we also hear a little bit about Bloody Stupid Johnson, who's like this architect. He's kind of a running gag throughout the series. He's just, he never de de designs anything properly. So he designed the Patrician's Gardens. So I think it said like he got the scales wrong. So for example, the maze was so small that people got lost trying to find it. This also features like the introduction of guns to the Discord. They're actually called Gons. And uh, they were designed by Leonard of Quirm, which is the, like the Discord's equivalent of Leonardo da Vinci. And for some reason, the patrician, in his wisdom, decided to give the uh, the plans for this this gone to the Assassins Guild. Uh, but they're usually quite trustworthy. But uh, I think they then get stolen, and then all hell breaks loose. And we've got you know guns in uh, Ankh Morpork. And then actually, what's interesting is at the end of this, basically, that kind of gets dealt with, and I think the plans are destroyed, and the, the gone is destroyed. And um, they don't come back to the Discord after that, so we have all of this as a new technology, but we kind of stick with the idea of gu guns are only in it for this one story, which I think is nice because it would be ruined by guns. We also have uh, every time somebody talks to Detritus, they'll go like, Lance Constable Detritus, don't salute! Because otherwise he's a troll and he'll salute really quickly and knock himself out, which I think is very troll-like. Although uh, there is a scene as well where... Um, they go into like this sort of place where I think they're keeping meat or something like that and it's really cold but trolls have silicon brains so they get more intelligent when they're in the cold so when they finally bust him out he's like written all these equations over the walls but he immediately starts to warm up and he can't remember what the equations are about and I think later on he gets like a special hat to keep his brain cool as well so that he can think better as befits an officer of the law. Uh, I, I found that I wasn't super involved in the story, although like the one-liners were great, obviously, like the humour was great, but the actual storyline itself, I think partly because I knew what happened, and so, I don't know, it didn't really feel like a whodunit either, you know, so, uh, whereas like I think some of the Watch novels are, and there's like a crime being committed and we're trying to solve it, whereas this was more... I don't know. Just more straight up fantasy, I guess. Uh, I also liked how the Gon could kind of think for itself, so people were like kind of hypnotized by the power of holding it and it made them want to shoot and uh, I don't know I can kind of see how that would be a thing as well like the psychology of gun ownership and I've heard people before talk about as well you know they when they have a gun in their hands they just feel more powerful which you would do you can take a life with it so all in all I did enjoy it for this reread I gave it a four out of five stars and I look forward to I think I've got some more city watch books coming up for rereads later this year so yeah, alright, and that brings us on to The Subtle Knife by Philip Pullman. This is book number two in the His Dark Materials trilogy. I shall read you the blurb. Will is 12 years old and he's just killed a man. Now he's on his own, on the run, determined to discover the truth about his father's disappearance. Then Will steps through a window in the air into another world and finds himself with a companion, a strange, savage little girl called Lyra. Like Will, she has a mission which she intends to carry out at all costs. But the world of Sitagaze is a strange and unsettling place. Deadly soul-eating spectres stalk its streets, while high above the wingbeats of distant angels sound against the sky. And in the mysterious Torre del Angeli lurks Sitagaze's most important secret, an object which people from many worlds would kill to possess. So, uh, Northern Lights, which is the first book in the series, is actually my favourite. This is probably my second favourite, and then the third is like my third favourite. Again, I listened to this on audiobook. It was read by Philip Pullman with like an ensemble cast as well. So we start off with Will, and Will has basically killed somebody by accident. And actually it's kind of annoying, because throughout he keeps getting referred to as a murderer. And even on my first read of this, I was like, that wasn't murder though. So I don't know, but um, 
Yeah, basically he's got this mother who kind of has like Alzheimer's like symptoms, but it's also hinted that they might be spectres, which uh, basically these sort of mystical beings from one of the other worlds that once you reach sort of puberty, they can kind of eat your soul, basically. They're not very nice. And uh, so, yeah, Will decides he's got to go on the run because these bad people are, you know, they're after him. They're trying to hurt his mother. This is how he accidentally killed somebody. They'd broken into his house. So he, he takes his mum to Mrs. Cooper, who is this piano teacher, and it says he hasn't seen her for a year, and that's the only person he can take her to. Like, he's got no friends, he's got no family. And I was just thinking, like, he must be so lonely. Uh, he does have a cat called Moxie, though, which he really loves, and, and that kind of reminded me of me and, me and Biggie and our relationship, to be honest. A lot of this is set in Oxford as well, which that kind of happens in the first book in Northern Lights, except that's set in the alternative Oxford, whereas this one is actually our Oxford. Uh, we have some stuff as well where... For example, we're talking about demons, which are these kind of creatures, I guess you have, that are kind of the physical manifestations of your soul, and they take the form of different animals. So uh, Lyra's talking to Will, and Lyra, we can see her demon, but Will can't see his, at least not yet. But um, she said that his demon would take a form that was savage, courteous, and unhappy. And I kind of wondered if that fits with what his demon eventually becomes in the form it settles in so I'll, I'll be looking forward to uh, rereading the third book to find out we also have lyra consults the alethiometer which is like a truth teller device uh, the golden compass as the book is called in north america that's what the, the golden compass is and she kind of consults it and it tells lyra that will is a murderer and she relaxes because she's like well you know where you stand with a murderer but actually he's not a murderer like, this guy, the, this guy that broke into his house, he kind of tripped over a cat and fell down some stairs, you know. He, it wasn't intentional, it wasn't murder. Manslaughter, maybe. But, um, the alethiometer's supposed to always tell the truth, and I'm like, but that's, he's not a murderer. Uh, then we have, uh, Serafina Pakala being Yambe Aka, so Serafina Pakala is a witch, and Yambe Aka is, like, the death of the witches. So, I think, basically, doesn't she, she I think she strips naked and approaches this other witch who's being tortured with a smile and like cuts her throat or something uh, just to, to kind of put her out of her misery but then she has to fight her way out of where she is there's also another witch called Ruta Skardi who's the queen of the witches from Latvia which I thought was cool because I went to Latvia last year we also have just a, a thought that Lyra has where she sort of thinks I wonder if there's another Lyra in this world kind of in our world and maybe whether there's, there's another will in her world and uh, it's kind of left unanswered but maybe, maybe there is, and maybe she Will found her after the third book, book because uh, basically the ending, yeah, I don't want to talk about the ending yet, so I will leave that thought uncompleted there. She uh, sees stuff from her world in a museum, like there's a, a Samoyed sled that she was actually kidnapped, and she was riding in Northern Lights, and she sees it in uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, although it's never actually identified by name, but you can tell that's where she means by the way it's described. And, uh, yeah, just our world is very alien to her, so she's never seen people just walking along and eating before, because in her world that's kind of not the custom, you know? There's also a character called Lee Scoresby who's in Northern Lights who kind of meets a sad end in this book, and uh, I was just getting really sad every time he was mentioned because I knew what was coming. I also liked the kind of how... Uh, uh, Grumman, Stanislaus Grumman, who is an, basically an explorer from Lyra's world. Another of his names is Japari, which is actually like a sort of a bastardization of John Parry, which means that he's Will's father. Also, we go to visit Charles, like Sir Charles, who I believe is like Lord Boreal from uh, Lyra's world, but he's sort of got into our world. And he lives in Headington, which is again another part of Oxford. It's actually where Bex was in hospital. And then there are these there are these doorways between worlds which the subtle knife can open. That's kind of its power, I guess. And it reminded me of the Stephen King quote, there are more worlds than these. I thought it was cool as well, because I kept kind of like preempting lines. So for example, I wrote down here, doesn't he describe his missing fingers as like bloody commas? Or did I imagine that? So uh, one of the characters loses some fingers during it. And no, it didn't say uh, bloody commas, he said they were curled like a bloody quotation mark. So it's just that image of these fingers, like a bloody quotation mark. It's obviously stuck in my head, you know? There's also a bit where a guy is talking about the subtle knife and, and, and the spectres as well. And he basically says the spectres are our fault and our fault alone, which is pretty good foreshadowing because there's uh, some sort of more exposition on the spectres in the third book and we find out what they really are and how they're created. But I wonder if this, this man knew and just didn't tell them the full story, you know? Uh, I don't know, it's interesting to, to think about whether that, that character did know. Although I always get confused as well, because basically he's like, oh, uh, the spectres are going to come soon, they will, uh, they'll follow the knife. And uh, basically Will's got the knife. And so he takes poison to avoid certain death at the spectres, except I'm like, well, they know where 
the window into our world is. So he could just go through the window into our world. He didn't have to die. It was just, I don't know why he made that decision, you know? That said, I suppose Will does think that spectres could come from our world. He thinks maybe we call them something else or they're not visible to us. And they could be the reasons for things like Alzheimer's, dementia, even depression, that kind of thing. Imagine like, uh, they're a bit like Dementors from Harry Potter, except I think these came out first. But um, yeah, they have that kind of similar effect on you. And, and I think, you know, both of them really are a metaphor for depression. There's also a lot of honey in this story, I noticed. Like it's just used to treat a wound at one point. They eat some at one point. And I don't know, I never noticed it before. And I think it's just because it's, it's not very vegan. There was also music in it to like separate each of the chapters and I didn't think it worked very well, especially at 1.75 times speed, but I don't I don't think it would have worked well. I don't know. It just was weird music, you know, it didn't go with the story. So there's a bit where uh, Pantalaimon says that uh, Will is the best friend that Lyra's ever had. And I'm there like, but what about Roger? That's like the point of their friendship. They've been friends forever. But I suppose, I mean, Will and Lyra do go through more together than uh, Roger and Lyra do. But it's over a shorter period of time, you know, and I think especially at this point, they haven't actually gone through that much together. So I don't know, it just seemed like a weird thing to say. Then we go to uh, chapter 14, the Alamo Gulch, which uh, basically is this badass chapter, but also somebody dies. Uh, <laughs> uh, Grumman, who again is Will's father, he's like learned how to manipulate the elements as a shaman. So he's bringing down lightning bolts to sort of strike these zeppelins as they're trying to kind of outrun the ministry, which is the church. And... Um, yeah, I thought that was cool, but it was also, I don't know, it's always a sad scene there for me because it's where one of my favourite characters dies as well. I also noted down it's weird not having the symbols because in the book, they have these symbols at the side of the page which tell you which world we're in. And we didn't have those, obviously, in the audiobook, so you just had to kind of figure it out, out as you go. So uh, that, was, that was strange, but I've read it so many times now that I can follow the story, you know. We also have this bit where uh, one of the uh, one of the witches is killed by one of the spectres, and we we kind of get to hear this little passage about what it's like. I wrote down "killed by a spectre." What way to go? So Pullman wrote, "Her last conscious thought was disgust at life. Her senses had lied to her. The world was not made of energy and delight, but of foulness, betrayal, and lassitude. Living was hateful, and death was no better. And from end to end of the universe, this was the first and last and only truth." I also thought it was cool that Miss, uh, Mrs. Coulter convinced the Spectres to work for her. I believe, basically, she convinced them they would get to eat more souls if they followed her than if they just stayed around and picked whoever they could. We have this uh, then fight between Will and his dad as well, because they're in the darkness. They don't know it's each other. And then they recognise each other just as his dad gets uh, killed by an arrow from a witch's bow. And it's this really harsh moment of realisation. I also thought I remembered the last lines. I thought it was Lyra had vanished, Lyra was missing, Lyra was gone. And what I was thinking of was Lyra was gone, Lyra was captured, Lyra was lost. But it wasn't the last line, it was about a paragraph before that. But yeah, all in all, really did enjoy this reread. This is actually a 5 out of 5 for me, uh, along with Northern Lights. And yeah, I'm looking forward to rereading The Golden Compass later this year. Okay, on that note, I have to go because my battery is apparently dying again. But as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.